that uh, we do record this and we'll, uh, if, if it all looks good, we'll post it to our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you don't want your thumbnail video recorded, you can go ahead and turn your video off. That's fine. We know you're still here. And after the speaker is done, we'll stop the recording and we won't record the, the Q and A at the end. It's a little more freedom uh, that way. But again, welcome. My name is Jason. If you guys have any questions, uh, use the, the raise your hand function or the chat function and we'll try to help you out. Uh, we're glad you made it. And uh, just a reminder, you can find out more about our other events, both previous and upcoming in the lecture series by checking out the McGill Religious Studies Facebook page. And we're happy to point you, or the, not our Facebook page, sorry, just our website, which I've put a link to in the chat. So uh, just to remind you all, I'll read our, a little bit of our intro about our project before I introduce our speaker. Um, so the Keenan Chair of Interfaith Studies, uh, Professor Armando Salvatore, and the James McGill Professor of Islamic Philosophy, Robert Wisnowski, um, are collaborating in a reflection on religion, Islam, and cosmopolitanism associated with McGill's academic tradition of Islamic studies and epitomized by scholars such as Wilfred Cantwell Smith, Falso Rahman, and Toshihiko Izutsu in preparation for the Keenan Conference on World Religions and Globalization, which we hope will be held in Montreal in the spring of 2022. We're hosting an online lecture series uh, titled Reorienting the Global Study of Religion, History, Theory, and Society. Again, you can find out more on our website, uh, McGill Religious Studies, or on our YouTube channel. And then for today, for our second lecture series, we have Fiala Hamza, uh, who will give a talk titled Decommissioning Ibn Khaldun, Sufis, Statesmen, and Publicists During the Long 19th Century. Diala Hamza is an associate professor of Arab history at the Université de Montréal. And she is the author of the forthcoming Mohammed Rashid, Rida ul Tuno Salafist. I'm sorry for my very poor French pronunciation. I try, not very well. Um, and she is also the editor of The Making of the Arab Intellectual from Rutledge. We are very pleased uh, that all of you could join us and to have uh, Professor Hamza uh, speak to us today. Uh, just as a reminder, we are recording, so please keep yourself muted for now. And uh, at the end, we'll hold your questions and we'll have a Q&A after we've stopped the recording. For that, I'll turn it over to Professor Hamza. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for, this, um, um, for this invitation. Um, as uh, Jason uh, mentioned, so the title uh, the funny title of my uh, talk today is uh, Decommissioning Ibn Khaldun, Sufi Statesmen and Publicists During the Long 19th Century. Uh, and I hope to, uh, through the lecture, to make the point of this, um, of, of this title. So Ibn Khaldun is uh, usually either uh, conjured as a theoretical uh, framework in order to make sense of the venture of Islamic Ottoman reform during the 19th century, or he is broken down to a cluster of atomized concepts, which then one attempts to trace in the thought of the said Islamic Ottoman reformers. Uh, both these readings partake um, in the blanket assumption of a European discovery of Ibn Khaldun, uh, making no room uh, for, I uh, contend, indigenous naturalization of the Ifriqi historian within the Ottoman center, as well as within the periphery, in whether in Sufi networks, in, bureauc in bureaucratic practice, or uh, later on in the public sphere. Uh, both these readings also obfuscate the fact that why the 14th century historian did not advocate reform, reformists uh, uh, for their part had no real vested interest in the discipline of history. Taking a step back from the usual genealogies of Islamic Ottoman reform, uh, this lecture explores the impact of such disjunctive readings on our reconstructions of the individual trajectories that made up the long 19th uh, century. It uh, proposes um, 
to simultaneously investigate the significance of Ibn Khaldun for such diverse figures as uh, the Sufi Muhammad Ibn Ali al Sanusi, uh, the statesman Khair al Din Pasha, and the publicist Muhammad Rashid Rada. Um, so it simultaneously investigates the significance of Ibn Khaldun for these figures as well as our own post Orientalist, with a question mark, agendas when making use of Ibn Khaldun to frame these authors. So maybe I'll just uh, start uh, with, a, with, a, with a quick word about the context, the context sorry, and the framework which I am using here to actually uh, investigate together uh, such diverse figures uh, uh, as um, Sanusi, uh, Khair al-Din and uh, Rashid Rudda, whom we uh, rarely uh, study together. Uh, so, uh, the reasons for my chronological framework, uh, the long 19th century, uh, um, needs to be uh, clarified as it impacts the choice of actors and authors under investigation. Uh, so, uh, what I would like to suggest um, is that it is largely by choosing such a framework that one is prompted to actually question the European discovery assumption behind um, um, Ibn Khaldun and, and his uh, so-called restoration to the Arabs uh, through the Europeans. I would also like to suggest that the long 19th century framework also elicits um, multiple Khaldunian genealogies uh, to which Ottoman and post-Ottoman actors were div diversely exposed and which is not uh, systematically maybe um, discussed. Uh, well, we Ottomanist historians have long made the arguments uh, for a circulation and integration of Ibn Khaldun since at least the end of the, the 16th century, uh, when after the conquest of Bilad al-Sham and Egypt, a steady flow of manuscripts actually started uh, streaming into the libraries of Istanbul from the newly acquired Arab provinces. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, Cornel Fleischer not only demonstrated when, how, and by whom Ibn Khaldun became appropriated, but he also showed the extent to which, um, the extent, sorry, of his shared worldview, if not his epistemology, in the work of other Ottoman historians, and namely uh, the bureaucrat Mustafa Ali. Uh, in other words, Cornel Fleischer distinctly underscored Khaldun's originality and limits thereof. He actually demonstrated or established that whereas um, Mustafa Ali might have come across uh, Ibn Khaldun at that stage, it was, it was not probable. Uh, um, later, Ottoman scholars, uh, Katib Shalabi and uh, Naima in the 17th century uh, would make explicit references to Ibn Khaldun uh, before uh, Piri Zadeh's uh, partial translation of the Muqaddimah into Turkish uh, would appear in the 18th century, around 1725 to 1730, uh, to the exception actually of uh, the later or the, um, the final part of the Muqaddimah and namely its chapter six on sciences. And finally, a full translation was eventually published uh, by Ahmad uh, Jawdat Pasha in 1858. Uh, Ottoman historian Cornel Fleischer, but now also Kenan Tekin, also revealed how Ottoman uh, translators not only translated but commented upon, added to uh, the original Khaldunian text, updating it, so to speak, uh, through their own situated worldviews and the needs of their eras. So this is one, I would say, contextual uh, um, stream, <laughs> maybe the Ottoman one, uh, which might actually account for one, at least one of uh, the actors under investigation here, namely Khair al-Din Pasha. But there's another one, at least, an, uh, at least another, uh, a second um, one, uh, besides, of course, the Orientalist um, um, framework. Uh, that other contextual strand pertains to um, Ibn Khaldun in the Arab provinces after the loss of Khaldunian manuscripts, first to the Ottomans in the 17th century and second to the Europeans during the 19th century. 
So, of course, I'm not contesting here at all that um, uh, there was a concomitant revival and publishing of Ibn Khaldun um, um, uh, on the Bulak uh, Press in 1857 and 1867 at the hand of Tahtawi, uh, after Tahtawi um, uh, returned from Paris and became head of the uh, translation bureau, so to speak, of uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha. Uh, so I'm not contesting, of course, that there is a concomitant revival between uh, the first ever publications of Ibn Khaldun's manuscripts in Egypt and the intense reoccupation of uh, French Orientalists and future colonialists with Ibn Khaldun since the beginning of the 19th century, um, including for purposes of colonial justification. Um, um, but I am saying that uh, it is not through um, uh, this um, uh, intense preoccupation that Ibn Khaldun was restored, uh, so to speak, to the Arabs through the West. Uh, the presence of his manuscripts, even if in small numbers, in the Maghreb and in Egypt uh, has been established. Um, we know about the adm admiration, for instance, of scholars such as the historian Jabarti and uh, the Alim Hassan Attar for uh, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, an attestation which is significant, if only because some of these uh, scholars also would become the teachers of some of the actors I'm interested in, namely uh, Muhammad ibn Ali al sanusi um, who uh, was taught by uh, Hassan al Attar. Uh, now that I have uh, basically um, re reminded us of um, those diverse contextual streams uh, relating to Ibn Khaldun uh, during uh, the age of Islamic and Ottoman reform. I would also like to stress before delving into uh, uh, an exposition, so to speak, of um, Ibn Khaldun and those three actors I have uh, singled out, I would like to stress that uh, uh, maybe the 19th century was <laughs> uh, the Khaldunian um, uh, or a Khaldunian age um, uh, on another level, um, which is, uh, I would say, uh, the presence of three competing sedentarization projects. Uh, one being, of course, the one carried out by the Ottoman state itself, which was desperately trying uh, through its uh, centralization to sedentarize uh, the nomads on its margins. Uh, whether in the north of the Arab, Arab Peninsula, uh, on the Iraqi uh, marshes and in Yemen. But also, of course, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, another sedentarizing uh, and, and of colossal uh, project of colossal um, uh, consequences, uh, especially later on, uh, which was, of course, the Wahhabi project going on in uh, the Arab Peninsula. Lastly, uh, uh, and I'm not excluding uh, other sedentarizing, uh, sedentarization projects, but I'm mentioning those three major ones. Lastly, of course, there is the Sanusi uh, project of sedentarization, which would go on uh, in Cyrenaica in the 19th century. Uh, so it is, you know, uh, in the, on the, in, um, with the background of uh, this context of the presence uh, of the Khaldunian text, um, um, the, the differential presence uh, of the Khaldunian text in those regions and uh, the um, sedentariz sedentarization projects coming on, that I would like to start my uh, inquiry into uh, those um, authors. So maybe uh, if uh, Jason has given me permission to share my screen, yes, I will um, <clears throat> project some, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, some, um, 
some illustrations uh, in, in a short PowerPoint just to present uh, the actors I'm going to, to talk about. Um, so uh, I suggest you know, to uh, carry out this investigation of recourse to uh, Ibn Khaldun by three different reformers uh, during the long 19th century, uh, but also uh, try to uh, make sense of what we're doing exactly when we, we ourselves resort to Ibn Khaldun in, the, in order to uh, frame, as I said, uh, those uh, actors of the long 19th century. Uh, I'll start uh, in a very basic way, chronologically, uh, with um, Muhammad Ibn Ali al-Sanusi, um, a Maghribi uh, scholar and, 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 and Sufi, uh, born in Mustaghanim, uh, who was trained in Fas, where he resided eight years before going on his first journey to uh, Mecca, uh, returning to the Maghrib, and uh, eventually um, um, settling in uh, what would become Libya in Cyrenaica, um, starting uh, to establish there his um, first uh, lodges, and uh, returning uh, many times during his life uh, to the Hijaz, where he maintained a base, uh, his a basis, and uh, from actually um, the, his whole uh, Sufi venture started and uh, continued uh, in an east-west uh, on an east-west axis. Uh, which uh, he, uh, on which he established um, the network of his um, Zawaya. So Sanusi would, might, might uh, appear as maybe an exemplary or a contradictory Khaldunian case. Uh, after him, uh, his son and then his grandsons, uh, for the four generations of Ibn Khaldun would uh, take on uh, the head, uh, to, uh, the head of the the order before being, of course, as uh, uh, some of you might know, being uh, crushed um, by the combined forces of uh, colonialism and eventually uh, Arab nationalism. Um, um, however. Um, uh, uh, there is another way of looking uh, uh, at the venture of uh, um, Muhammad ibn Ali Sanusi, which has been uh, advanced by uh, French historian Jean Triot, um, who actually sees in the in the story of the order, uh, uh, in which, by the way, I'm not interested. My main uh, interest is in the founder of the order, Muhammad ibn Ali Sanusi. There's a lot that has been written. There is a lot that has been documented on the order on what happens once uh, the colonial aggression sets in. But uh, uh, for my part, I have been interested mainly in the life and work of the founder of the order, who, who as you, you might see on the PowerPoint, dies in 1859. Um, so, one way is to, of, of course, you know, uh, summon uh, uh, the easy um, uh, Khaldunian paradigm to read uh, the story of this um, uh, of this uh, Sufi order. Another one, which is the one uh, mentioned by uh, I mentioned, being that of the French historian Jean Triot, would actually uh, see in the story of this order um, uh, the um, a reversed. Uh, Khaldunian paradigm. Uh, what does uh, Jean-Louis Trillo say? Uh, he says uh, that the Sanusis who were, who saw themselves as civilizers, as urban dwellers, came to the desert to actually civilize uh, the Badu. Uh, so in a way, with the, the story of this um, Sufi order, uh, Ibn Khaldun's uh, schema has been, you know, uh, put upside down. Um, what I mean, there is a there is a lot to be uh, said about uh, the model suggested by Jean Vitrio, uh, or by those who might just want to uh, apply uh, and the the um, the paradigmatic um, model uh, Khaldunian model. 
what I'm interested in is just uh, to uh, underscore the fact that um, Muhammad ibn Ali Sanusi's story needs to be retrieved from both these uh, streams. Uh, we have to get past a very thick colonial historiography and its legacy uh, to uh, have um, uh, to, to access actually his story uh, as, as much as we need to actually uh, get past, in my opinion, the Khaldunian model in order to have a sense of what this man was trying to do. Um, I, I have uh, uh, entitled uh, this, this part of the PowerPoint, the places of Islamic entrepreneurship during the long 19th century to, to give you a better sense of also why I have chosen three very distinct figures. One, a Sufi whose main uh, um, life and work has been uh, in the Zawayas, which he has built uh, mainly outside urban centers, but not only. Um, and the, the life and work of Khairuddin uh, Pasha, who was a statesman and a bureaucrat, and the life and work of Rida, who was a publicist and whose, whose reform, reformist ideas were couched into a journal. Um, uh, the, the, so uh, one of the sites uh, for, for each of these authors is going to be um, uh, what they have written, and uh, as far as um, um, Sanusi is concerned, uh, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, his book, Al-Durar al-Saniya fi Akhbar al-Sulala al-Idrisiya. I said in my introduction that uh, Islamic reformers were, had no vested interest in history. Um, this needs to be qualified uh, as far as uh, Sanusi is concerned. Uh, it needs to be lightly qualified because even though he has written this um, um, historiography, uh, uh, it has to be put in context within uh, the majority of his writings, which have absolutely nothing to do with history, but a lot to do with fiqh and, 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 and Sufi writings. Uh, he was a prolific writer um, amongst the something like 50 works he's written, 10 have um, um, survived. Um, and most of them, as I said, uh, deal with um, uh, fiqh uh, and with, um, uh, with uh, fahrasa uh, with, uh, and with Sufi literature. So, so I could um, mention eventually uh, later on some of the titles of uh, his works. Um, this Dora Rasaniya fi Akbar Sulala al Idrisiya was, of course, written in order to um, um, ascertain his uh, Sharifian um, uh, genealogy, as well as to um, make uh, a point about uh, his Idrisid. Uh, so, uh, uh, while writing a history of Idrisid states, of which he identifies six. Um, he is also ascertaining and establishing uh, his own uh, uh, Sharifian uh, genealogy. Um, uh, while quoting uh, profusely uh, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun, even if not correctly, or in a very selective manner, uh, or in a very uh, casual manner, uh, as when he uh, goes out of his way to establish that Ibn Tumart, um, the founder uh, of the uh, al muwahidun movement and later dynasty uh, was actually a Sharifian. Uh, and he says that, uh, he, I mean, to make his point, he quotes supposedly Ibn Khaldun, whose position on uh, the so-called Sharifian uh, uh, <coughs> genealogy of Ibn Tumart uh, is more than uh, contorted, if, or at least, uh, uh, highly ambivalent. Uh, so, how to make sense of uh, this 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 book, this uh, this um, this work uh, among uh, his life work? Um, uh, well, Sanusi, uh, as I said uh, earlier, was a Farsi um, 
was a Fasi and an Idrisi, uh, who, who was trained at first before uh, continuing his, his quest of knowledge and, and his training uh, in, in Mecca and Medina. Uh, while in, in Fas, he was trained, um, he was initiated, sorry, into many um, um, uh, Sufi orders, uh, many Shadili, uh, most notably uh, Sufi orders, amongst them uh, the Nasiri. And I uh, would like to suggest that uh, we look at um, <clears throat> His, his, um, his life work, the founding of this huge network of uh, Sanusi Zawaya, um, uh, Zawaya's uh, from the Hijaz uh, to, uh, uh, to the Maghreb and down into uh, the Sudan and Chad, uh, as actually having probably its roots um, in a, a profoundly Maghrebi, actually, uh, um, model and probably a Nasri uh, model, uh, the Shadili uh, Nasri uh, in, in, in its uh, Nasri um, variation, uh, being one of these uh, hugely influential uh, scholarly Sufi orders founded outside of uh, major urban centers uh, in the Maghreb. Sanusi was also a federator of tribes, uh, uh, as sedentarizer, as I have said, along with other sedentarizers such as the Ottomans and the Wahhabis. He was also a unifier of orders. His wish and his um, um, uh, project was, and, and this is contrary to one other very influential order at the time, the Tijaniya, his uh, project was to actually unify and uh, uh, not just the schools of law, which is a very uh, Islamic reformist stance, stance uh, but uh, the actual Sufi orders. So contrary to Tijani, who basically wanted to replace them, uh, Sanusi want, uh, Sanusi's hope or project was to actually uh, polish the differences and unify the different uh, Sufi orders. Uh, was he to be seen as a pan-Islamist? I also contend that the, the whole story of pan-Islamism needs to be written from many, very, uh, very many different perspectives, <clears throat> from a top-down one, uh, the Ottoman uh, Sultan downwards, but also uh, from the bottom-up, uh, uh, i.e. from um, the public sphere, uh, and also uh, from uh, the perspective and from the level of uh, uh, such Islamic entrepreneurs as, uh, as Sufis, the like of uh, Sanusi. Uh, it is important also to, if we want to replace what he is doing and um, to what extent uh, he fits into uh, the Khaldunian paradigm or, or what sense exactly he's trying uh, I mean, how significant it is for him to actually invoke uh, um, Ibn Khaldun in his work to remember that he is founding his order um, in Cyrenaica after the Ottoman uh, reconquest of, 19, of 1835, but, and it is highly significant, before uh, the uh, very important Ottoman land reforms which were about to um, start uh, at mid-century, or rather as of 1858 and up until you know, 1869. And there were two uh, new codes and one uh, law uh, concerning the reform of the, uh, of the land during that time. Why am I mentioning this? Because uh, it has direct repercussion, not only on what Sanusi was actually doing, uh, within the tribal environment in which he had chosen to uh, actually uh, expand his network of um, uh, 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 Zawaya. Um, but because it also tells us why the order eventually moved south. It has been uh, advanced and said that uh, the more the pressure, the political pressure uh, whether from the Ottomans or from uh, the Italians uh, uh, became intense, the, the more 
he uh, migrated south. Um, well, he's not concerned with the Italians since he dies in 1859, um, but uh, it has been said for, uh, to uh, actually make sense of the southern migration of the order uh, at the hand of his successors. Uh, but one thing that has not been taken into account uh, globally in, in writing the history of, of uh, the order, but which has been uh, 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 amazingly uh, established by Michel Legal um, uh, is that uh, the, the order was actually <clears throat> expanding thanks to uh, tribes turning tribal land into Sanusi Awqaf, okay? Uh, and why did the order eventually migrate to the south, well, to Kufra uh, mostly? Well, maybe not just because of uh, <clears throat> political pressure from the north, uh, but because uh, the, the, the more south you migrated, the less you were uh, actually um, susceptible to uh, come under uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the, those new land codes of the, the, that the Ottomans uh, were trying to uh, implement. Um, and so this would explain uh, uh, how, you know, um, wh why uh, the order was moving the way it was moving and expanding the way it was expanding. Um, <clears throat> Jason, I don't know uh, uh, where we are as far as the time is concerned. I would like to proceed uh, to uh, um, my uh, second uh, author, which is uh, Khairuddin uh, Natasha. Uh, uh, you're doing well time-wise, so okay. uh, keep going. Uh, just, just to know, because I can't see the time. Uh, okay, uh, about 15 more minutes. Perfect. So Khairuddin, who was... Um, uh, <clears throat> a Mamluk uh, who uh, was sold to um, to Ahmad Bey and who grew up and, and actually um, served uh, the Ottoman state and uh, the Tunisian uh, polity uh, all his life, uh, uh, is of course an insider um, uh, who would uh, offer the uh, uh, reforming Ottoman polity. He would uh, go on to become a Grand Vizier in Istanbul. Uh, uh, his uh, fortunes have been much compared to those of, uh, or misfortunes rather, <laughs> political misfortunes have been uh, obviously much compared to those of Ibn Khaldun himself. Um, he, uh, uh, of course, was at the helm of the uh, first uh, constitution of uh, the uh, Ottoman Islamic world, uh, the uh, constitution, uh, the Tunisian constitution of 1861, followed by, uh, which abruptly came to an end with the revolt of 1864. He was part of a circle of reformers, um, amongst whom were Muhammad Bayram and Ibn Abi Diaf. Uh, in 1867, he wrote Aqwam, uh, Aqwam al Masalik fi uh, Ma'rifat Ahwal al Mamalik, the surest path to knowledge regarding the condition of countries, um, to which, uh, uh, of which, sorry, uh, the Muqaddimah uh, is uh, also uh, the most known uh, part. So uh, he too wrote a, a Muqaddimah. His Muqaddimah is suffused with uh, Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah. It is suffused with references as well uh, to uh, specific semantic fields, uh, those of justice and civilization, uh, with the words Adl, Hurriya, Zulm, Humran, Tamaddun. And uh, uh, so he publishes um, his, his, this work in 1867, which is uh, mostly addressed to the Ottoman center. And I mean the, Otto the Ottoman center and not uh, the Ottomans at large because of uh, there being so little reference to the actual history of Tunisia in, 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 in the book, which reads more like a political treatise than an actual history. Uh, and also, it's also addressed to Europeans. 
Um, so uh, because of that mainly, uh, it is important to keep in mind uh, both texts, the Arabic and the French. Uh, the year after it comes out in Arabic, it, it is published in French under the supervision of um, Khairuddin Pasha himself. Uh, and uh, I, I'm more and more inclined to think that uh, <clears throat> Uh, th this work needs to be read, um, both versions need to be read in, in, uh, in conjunction, the translated and uh, the original Arabic. Uh, uh, actually also it's, um, it's, it's a uh, eventual Turkish counterpart because uh, of um, uh, amazing discrepancies <laughs> between uh, the Arabic uh, and the French. And again, I, I, I insist that uh, the translation was done under the supervision of Khairuddin, who knew French. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, the discrepancies are not accidental, but obviously uh, deliberate. Uh, amongst those uh, discrepancies, I don't know if we should even turn them like that, but uh, uh, you would have those passages talking about the recent uh, revolutionary history of France, where um, um, uh, Khairuddin Pasha is talking about uh, revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries and the words chosen, uh, I mean, <clears throat> these are the words that are rendered in the French, but in, in the Arabic, the, the words chosen are mutamaddinun uh, uh, and mutawahishun, an amazing choice uh, of words uh, directly, of course, sourced in uh, Ibn Khaldun's uh, semantic field uh, for talking about um, uh, um, people partaking in uh, Umran and uh, those opposed to them, except that Tawahush in, uh, in um, uh, Ibn Khaldun does not exactly uh, translate as counter-revolutionary. Uh, but uh, obviously what is going on uh, in in, in, the, in this text, which again profusely um, relates to Ibn Khaldun and quotes uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, is uh, at the same time uh, a flattening of uh, or a destruction of uh, the circles of history and the flattening of uh, the cycles um, by inscribing uh, the, the historical dynamics uh, at work in Ibn Khaldun on a linear uh, plane, which is that of progress. Um, and the, uh, the mechanisms uh, foreseen uh, to put an end to the eternal cycles of history uh, are, um, of course, constitutionalism uh, on the one side, uh, which it is is hoped uh, will put an end not so much to the coming of uh, the barbarians or the coming of uh, uh, the Bedou and the replacement of a dynasty, but to put an end to corruption, to put an end to injustice, um, uh, and um, to put an end to, to unaccountability. This is on one side. On the other side, there is uh, another site. I, I, I told you earlier that uh, there were two main sites uh, of uh, inquiry or investigation concerning um, this project of looking at those three actors together, what they wrote, but also uh, where they carried out um, their uh, reformist uh, ideals or ideas, which was um, for most of them um, education. And so, um, um, Khairuddin, uh, amongst uh, his works or achievements, was the founding of uh, the Sadiqi College in 1875, um, uh, which was a school, uh, a first modern school, uh, preserving uh, the traditions, but also introducing um, uh, um, beneficial modern uh, sciences, uh, so al-ulum al-naqliya, but also al-ulum al-aqliya, 
uh, as well as uh, as well as uh, foreign languages, and mostly catering not just uh, to uh, Tunisians. Uh, I mean, not just to inhabitants of the city of Tunis, but also of uh, what uh, is termed in Arabic al afaq al tunisia so the uh, the countryside, the 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 rural rural areas, the rest of uh, the country. Uh, and so uh, I try and see in uh, the invocation of, uh, Khair, um, of Ibn Khaldun by Khair al-Din, um, uh, the, the quite typical recourse of an Ottoman uh, functionary to a text that has been completely naturalized in bureaucratic thoughts, and practice since centuries, actually. Um, uh, but with, of course, uh, a twist here, since what is now being asked of that, uh, uh, of that text is to actually um, neutralize <laughs> the dynamics it is seeing uh, uh, through history. Um, uh, so, um, I will move to um, uh, my third actor, uh, Muhammad Rashid Rida, uh, and uh, his um, his uh, position towards uh, Ibn Khaldun being probably the one that is uh, the most removed uh, as uh, um, compared to uh, my other two actors. Um, uh, Rida obviously being uh, susceptible to that other uh, contextual stream I talked about in the introduction, uh, which was not the Ottoman uh, stream, um, contextual stream, but uh, the one proper to uh, the Arab provinces. Um, his um, uh, access to um, Ibn Khaldun uh, of whom he talks uh, very little, uh, for whom he has uh, not a huge amount of um, admiration or interest, uh, probably coming from um, uh, his um, uh, mentor, uh, uh, Muhammad Abdu, whom we know, we know read uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, with his own master, um, um, Al Afghani, and whom we know taught actually the text as well uh, in Cairo as in uh, Beirut while he was uh, exiled there. Um, so, uh, as far as uh, Muhammad Rashid Rida is concerned, uh, Muhammad Rashid Rida, as uh, many of you uh, will know, uh, was this uh, um, uh, very important uh, uh, publicist who uh, was uh, one of the main publicists actually of the emerging public sphere uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt and Syria at um, the turn of the 20th century during the Nahda, uh, who founded the journal Al-Manar, which went on from 1898, the date of his migration to Cairo from uh, Tripoli in Lebanon until his death in 1935. Um, uh, uh, Rida actually uh, problematizes uh, Ibn Khaldun or his resort to Ibn Khaldun uh, in two major, um, uh, okay, on two major occasions. And I would um, choose to actually uh, problematize um, myself, his resort to uh, Ibn Khaldun in terms of um, his um, uh, problematic relationship to history and his problematic, as problematic relationship to sociology. So we're talking about a man who actually uh, um, puts uh, 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 foremost um, expediency and public opinion uh, uh, before um, in pensée de système or uh, um, um, a coherent um, uh, uh, positioning or a coherent um, 
the coherent sustaining of principles throughout his career. So what am I talking about? Um, uh, first, maybe uh, let me talk about uh, maybe the most obvious uh, before I talk about his school. Um, let me talk about the book uh, where he actually uh, is seen flipping the coin, so to speak, i.e. changing his position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the famous uh, Qurayshite uh, condition. So should the uh, Khalifa be uh, of the tribe of Quraysh um, or not? Um, uh, first, a word on um, the supposed book in which uh, he flips the coin, Al Khilafa or Al Imam Al Uzma, which is not a book, which is not a, a treatise, as ha has been said and keeps being said all over, over and over again. It is a series of articles that uh, Muhammad Rashid Rida writes on the occasion of the abolition of the caliphate by the Ottomans. Uh, and the and the series of article of articles uh, are published in 2023. Surrounding also uh, um, uh, uh, the debates that he will have also with Ali Abdul Razak, who uh, 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 takes a strong stance uh, against uh, uh, the caliphate in his book. So, in the winter of 2023, after um, uh, uh, Turkey, sorry, uh, abolishes first uh, the Sultanate before abolishing uh, later on uh, a year later the uh, the Caliphate. Rida um, writes the series of articles, which then he will compile into book form and 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 sell out as Al Khilafa or Al Imam Al Uzma. Um, uh, this, uh, what will become the book, is actually divided into two parts. The first presenting uh, the theoretical foundation of the caliphate, while the second part uh, concentrates on Rida's uh, suggestions for creating a new caliphate, given uh, the crisis that uh, the uh, post-Ottoman world is uh, going through. Um, in the first part, Rida quotes al muwardi and other medieval jurists, um, who wrote about the necessity of the caliphate. Uh, quotes, of course, the uh, uh, expected hadith uh, that uh, established the necessity of seating a, a caliph, of, of giving him the bay'ah, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but whereas uh, very early on, after he founds his journal in 1898, uh, uh, 99, uh, he, um, he uh, is not insistent that the caliph should be of, uh, of, the, of the Quraysh. He will eventually completely, as I said, flip the coin and uh, change uh, his mind in 22, 23, when he actually uh, comes up with these uh, articles. Uh, so if I take you through the um, uh, arguments, um, he first, uh, when he starts out his career, says that um, um, uh, one of the bases of Islam is the pursuit of authority and power, uh, making uh, Sharia the supreme principle of rule. Um, and uh, he then supports the Ottomans uh, uh, for this very reason, because Islam cannot be sustained without a state, uh, even though he criticizes them uh, at the same time. Um, and in so doing, uh, he elicits a normative understanding of Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah. Uh, he says that Ottomans uh, are not ideal caliphs uh, since their authority is based on the asabiya of mulk, not religion. Okay, and this is something he will <laughs> come back to um, uh, later on. Um, on the other hand, and we're still in 1898-99, uh, uh, the Arabs of Quraysha descent, i.e. the Hashemites of Hejaz, um, who, no, sorry, now we're later on, we are in the 20s of the 20th century, who opted for an alternative Arab caliphate to replace uh, the Ottoman. Uh, he sees them as lacking uh, other important requirements. Uh, Muhammad Haddad, who has um, um, perfectly summed uh, 
the, the different opinions and positionings of uh, Reda concerning the caliphate, uh, notes that uh, scholars have failed uh, to um, take note that uh, at this time, uh, Rida was actually explicitly uh, expressing agreement with Ibn Khaldun when he explained the hadith which says the imamate belongs to Quraysh and that this uh, hadith uh, had its uh, rationale in the Quraysh influence and authority during the early Islamic era. Um, but this was the only time where he would voice uh, such an opinion. And uh, it, it is, in, uh, as I said, in 1922 that he reverses the stance. Uh, uh, since in 22, and contrary to what he said in 1898, he says, um, uh, he refuses to accept Ibn Khaldun's notion of the linkage, uh, linkage excuse me, between Asabiya and competence on the grounds that it was based on um, common ancestry or race, a notion uh, which shocks uh, Rida and because he sees it as being in contradiction to Islam and its tenets uh, for uh, Rida indeed. Um, uh, any asabiya that uh, actually is based in uh, common descent or race only applies uh, to uh, pre-Islamic tribes. It does not apply uh, to any uh, social reality uh, of today. Uh, needless to say, uh, this uh, will be uh, very soon forgotten, not very soon, but a decade later when he decides to support the Wahhabis as the only possible candidates to save uh, uh, the Islamic world, uh, all of a sudden uh, the Quraysh, uh, Qurayshi um, uh, principle does not uh, come into play anymore. Uh, needless to say, uh, this uh, so-called book is not a historical book. Uh, it's a, it's a very uh, it's very uh, doctrinal. It's also um, I would say very delusional in the sense that it is not sociological at all, as in this uh, almost science fiction passage where he is actually envisaging that since today the Hijaz is not a place to um, transfer the caliphate to since clearly the Ottomans, uh, the post-Ottomans, the Turks are not interested in keeping it. But the Hijaz under the Hashemites is not exactly a good place. So let's find an intermediate place. And how about Mosul? See, the name Mosul is this Silla <laughs> between Turks and Arabs. And we could even annex you know, the lands uh, around Mosul and then just you know, put the caliphate there. So there is clearly, I mean, a deliberate non-sociological, non-historical approach to the institution of the caliphate. It is doctrinal and it is based in political expediency when uh, Rashid Ruda comes to decide on how to reform, how to revive, how to save the institution today. Um, this has to be understood in his uh, attitude towards history, uh, which is, uh, to say the least, uh, very flimsy, very sketchy. Um, uh, and maybe I will allow myself to give you some anecdotes <laughs> uh, as far as uh, Rida and history uh, uh, are concerned. Rida was always very prompt to attack others, his enemies, and he had many, uh, uh, where he thought lay their, their, their weakest um, point as far as their knowledge was concerned. So for, his, for instance, he is prompt to attack his uh, Azharite nemesis, uh, Muhammad Bakhit al Muti'i. Uh, saying that he has absolutely no notions of geography. Uh, this he does uh, at one point when uh, uh, Bakhit becomes the Mufti of Egypt. And uh, he supposedly <laughs> um, gives a fatwa to someone from Salonika in Anatolia. And so, of course, he, he copiously mocks his uh, absence of uh, geographical knowledge. He is also very prone to attack others who he feels are trespassing on his or 
Muslim's prerogative, which is uh, Islamic history in which he does not engage par ailleurs. For instance, he attacks Georgi Zaidan's popular historical novels as well as his history of Islamic civilization, but he is um, clever enough not to attack him directly. He is after all uh, a compatriot and a fellow journalist, but he lets other attack him and he publishes these attacks in his own journal. Uh, uh, as far as uh, this attack is concerned, we're talking about the uh, Indian uh, Shibli uh, Nahmani, who uh, will criticize heavily uh, Georgi Zaidan's um, history in Al Manar in 1912. But uh, Reda does not escape also being attacked precisely on his own uh, historical failings, uh, historical knowledge uh, failings. Uh, as in this uh, article, which um, is actually published uh, uh, years after his death in 1949 by Mahmoud al-A'ad, uh, who describes him as alim fadd la yana bil ma'arif al asriya and where he is actually taking Rida to task on his ignorance of Egyptian history. Um, what is surprising is that uh, is his pretensions. Uh, so um, Rida, uh, sorry, actually founds a school in uh, 1912, which will, I mean, he, it took him uh, a decade to get it uh, established. He tried to get the support of the Ottomans uh, for this um, a missionary school, uh, which he conceived as an anti-Azhar uh, and in which he actually wanted and, and did train Duha and Murshidun to go out and convert or get uh, Muslims back to their faith. Uh, it closed in 1914 uh, with the uh, um, um, with the start of the First World War and never uh, reopened after that. But what is fascinating is that uh, it was uh, a project that was extremely dear to his heart. He spent a whole year. Uh, in 1909 to 1910 in Istanbul, trying to, just after the revolution, trying to convince um, uh, the, um, the Ottomans to actually uh, not only fund that institute, uh, but without any interference, uh, but tax exemptions and no uh, uh, conscription, et cetera, et cetera. And he also wanted it founded in Istanbul. It didn't work, so in the end, uh, he got it funded uh, um, in, in, in Egypt. Um, uh, and a year before, he actually publishes in Al Manar the syllabus of this future school. And among uh, some of the pedagogical innovations uh, were uh, some uh, books that he had wanted to commission or to have uh, written by the time the school opened. Uh, but what, which actually never came to light. And one of those books uh, was an actual uh, history of Islam and the church. Uh, what is fascinating is that uh, given his investment in the project, given uh, the hopes he had that through this, uh, such an institute, uh, you know, uh, he might accomplish a reversal of the fortunes of Islam, um, and then the, the, the syllabus was not ready uh, when, the, when, when the school opened its doors in 1912. Uh, and I find it uh, uh, ironic that precisely the history book <laughs> was not ready uh, in 1912 uh, when, the, when the school opened. Um, <clears throat> a last point on Rada before I, uh, I finish um, has also to do with his approach to sociology. Um, I, I will just quote this uh, to, rapidly uh, to, to, to end, uh, because I have written uh, on that uh, topic uh, in a paper which was published two years ago um, in Egypt uh, Mulahab, and which has to do with precisely uh, Rashid Rudad's um, um, inability or um, uh, reluctance to actually engage uh, in a sociological book, one of the first major sociological books published in Egypt, 
by one uh, Muhammad Omar, on whom uh, Alain Roussillon has written, and who writes this fascinating uh, um, nationalist sociology of, of, of Egypt, where he also revisits, revisits uh, the social makeup of uh, of uh, of, e of, uh, of Egypt, uh, where he details uh, uh, what the so what the social body is made up, uh, what the social classes are in Egypt at the time, uh, and in a manner typical of uh, of Frida, who absolutely wanted to always account for everything that was being said and published at the time but who uh, very skillfully skirted um, uncomfortable subjects. He very often published uh, book reviews on books he had not read or that he would have, he would have read very, very um, superficially. Uh, and this is the case of this Kitab Hadar al Masrigin al Sir Ta'akhruhim, which was uh, published in 1902. Um, and uh, where uh, Muhammad Omar actually resorts to uh, the Khaldunian concept of Hasabiya, but in a nationalist uh, 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 um, um, meaning, uh, but where actually um, uh, Rida is, is unable actually to, to relate to this, um, to this usage. Uh, and therefore, basically, uh, does not um, engage uh, engage in the book. Uh, um, sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I think uh, I, I will probably not. Um, uh, talk a lot more about um, uh, this this famous uh, uh, book review that he wrote on uh, on uh, Muhammad Omar's book, but I will happily uh, answer any questions you might have uh, about it, um, uh, and which was uh, another missed occasion on the part of Rida uh, of engaging with that uh, concept of asabiya. Uh, this time, you know, uh, recuperated in a nationalist uh, framework. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I will maybe uh, stop there without a, a proper conclusion, except uh, as uh, to say that uh, uh, in, in the three uh, cases um, put to the study here, um, the Khaldunian framework uh, um, presents, of course, very um, 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 challenging and interesting uh, overtures in order to read uh, those um, actors, but I'm not sure to what extent we can uh, <clears throat> escape uh, um, uh, we can really escape a colonial reading of these actors uh, uh, in our, uh, you know, resorting to the framework of Ibn Khaldun uh, to try and make sense of what these um, actors were trying to do and what they were writing and what they were thinking. Uh, I hope I might have um, at least um, made the point that Ibn Khaldun uh, was um, much more naturalized, much more present, uh, even if differentially uh, in, in different sections of that um, uh, Ottoman and Maghribi uh, world um, at the time. Uh, and that it is uh, through the interplay of uh, those different contextual streams that any, anything meaning, meaningful uh, about uh, Ibn Khaldun's presence and his significance for these actors uh, should or could be said. And I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamza. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you today. Uh, and thank you all uh, to all of our attendees. We'll open it up to discussion now.
I just want to remind you all that um, you can find previous lectures uh, from the series posted on our YouTube channel. And uh, you should check our website out for our upcoming lecture series. Uh, the next lecture is going to be January 27th with Professor Timur Hamant and uh, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. And you can check our website for the Zoom information for that. So I'll stop the recording now and we